18 years ago, I read Ray Kurzweil's brand new book at the time called The Singularity is Near. And he, if you don't know about Ray Kurzweil, he's a futurist. He invented, my first encounter with his work was he invented a series of musical instruments and electromusical instruments when I was a kid and became known for that. He also became known for speech synthesis and text-to-speech optical character recognition, flatbed scanners. So he's an inventor. Google hired him as a kind of a futurist in residence. And, uh, but 18 years ago, he published this book called The Singularity is Near, which is about what he calls the technological singularity, a time in the near future when things will be changing so rapidly that people basically won't be able to keep up or that we won't be able to adapt in time. Things will be changing so fast that society and individuals as a whole don't have time to adapt. And, and because and he, he likened it to the singularity of a black hole, you can't see what's on the event horizon, but you can't even predict in certain ways, what's, what would be there. And the kind of bellwether event for that, that he talks about is when artificial intelligence finally reaches at least human intelligence and then ultimately superhuman levels of intelligence. And, and so he's had, he's definitely had a share of detractors, but the kind of consensus among artificial intelligence researchers that, you know, was when he started saying it was going to be around what, 2029 or something like that was that, no, it's going to take a hundred years for computers to reach human level intelligence. Now they're saying like 2030, 2031 at this point, he's basically pretty happy that he feels like he's been right all along. The things seem to be falling into the hockey stick kind of exponential curve. And I'm understanding his latest book, which is called the singularity is nearer, which will should be coming out soon is, uh, has many charts in it that show how many things in terms of well-being, income value earned per unit you know, of time and for real dollars and so on are all going up exponentially. Um, Worldwide, he's quite the optimist. Some would say he's too optimistic and some would say he's a threat because he's definitely the kind of transhumanist philosophy that believes that we are all destined essentially to become human computer living beyond our mortal forms in many ways, or at least, and, and he basically says that the only way to avoid um, becoming victimized by our super intelligent technology is to have, is to bring it inside us. So it's part of us and we are operating possibly with thousands or millions of times more intelligently than we were before. Now, obviously it's still all science fiction, but certain things are pointing in that direction. Now we're seeing some amazing progress in AI. It's still kind of dumb compared to humans, but it's got this spark that has something that's there. Everybody's recognizing it, which is why OpenAI went from zero to millions of customers within a month. And, and so I thought this would be a good thing for us to talk about. And, you know, I've got a couple other ideas that I want to introduce, but I'd like to hear your opening remarks, Michael. Yeah, I think this is a very broad topic. Obviously, there's a lot of people who have a lot of thoughts on it. I don't believe that we're very close to human level intelligence, but I don't think that really discounts Kurzweil's singularity. So there's a way that I approach this is that in order for something to be seen at a big scale, it needs to be seen at a small scale. And one of the things that we need to see at a small scale is the ability for a recursive program to get better every time the loop is run. And to my understanding, that is currently not possible. The fastest way that recursive learning happens in a system is when the human operator who wrote the system observes the effects on the world and then makes changes. And that human in the loop, for me, is the thing that we would want to see before we'd make a statement about runaway superintelligence. The other thing is that the amount of compute neurons, et cetera, that we see today in drones closely approximates what we see in insects and the drones that we observe are able to behave in an insect like manner. And then the last thing that I would comment is that humans are pretty good at chess, but computers that has capabilities less than that of insects are better than humans at chess. And so my question would be, as we increase the size of our neural nets towards higher order animals, mice, birds, cats, dogs, chimpanzees, and then finally humans, what tasks become available to us that we didn't have before? And is there a situation where a chimpanzee level intelligence across 10 domains versus a human intelligence across every domain, that chimpanzee level intelligence is just orders of magnitude more capable than us. And so we appreciate it as an AGI when in fact, it's not more sophisticated than a chimp. 
So anyway, that's my three points on this. And I'd love for you to steer the conversation to what is interesting. Sure. For you. Obviously there's our understanding of the nature of human intelligence is I would say overall pretty weak, but we are learning more all the time. But one thing we do know, I, one of the best kind of definitions of intelligence I've heard is the ability to solve problems under varying circumstances. So you're presented with a new or novel kind of circumstance and you can somehow come up with a solution. There's a very famous piece of behavioral psychology research, which showed that pigeons put into boxes, given a goal, which is to reach some food that's out of its reach, will actually stack cubes in, given to them in the boxes to actually reach the food, even though, because they can't actually, I guess their wings are clipped, or they can't fly up to it because it's too small a box and so on, but they'll actually stack boxes and climb up onto the box and get the food. And that is in indicative of some kind of intelligence. Another thing is that humans, humans aren't the only species that uses tools. Um, but we are the only species that reflects on using tools as far as we know. And the tools we create have, are becoming exponentially better. And I'm walking around my house right now with my phone in my hand, AirPod Pro Max is on my head, and I'm using these tools like they're extensions of myself. In many ways, just like when I drive my car as an extension of my body and lets me go 60, 70 miles an hour, my phone lets me reach with my mind out into the whole world, have conversations like this, even though I'm ostensibly alone in my house, that was never possible before. So technology as a lever is getting longer and longer, letting us lift heavier and heavier loads. And we take this all in stride. And this is where I'm starting this conversation from is that if you are the frog boiling in the pot, I know it's apocryphal, but you know, that idea, if things are changing around you, but you're taking, but you're adapting them as quickly as you can, then it's like the water you swim in. My, my son has never known a time in his life without the internet. I do. It's very difficult to explain to him what it was like before that. And I think that I'm already seeing a lot of symptoms of people unable to cope with the rate of change. And some of those people are older, but some of the people are younger too. And you can tell they're just not a good fit for the technology because they haven't had time and maturity to, to adapt to it. So they're getting sucked into it in very kind of maladaptive ways. And I think that if I'm going to make the case that Chris Wells right, and I'm only going to make that weekly, that his, that the symptoms of the singularity are already here and we're seeing them, but we're not, we're, but we're just saying, blowing them off because yeah, the world sucks, but it's sucking in kind of new and unique ways and, and a lot of good ways too. But like I say, this kind of conversation couldn't happen even a couple of years ago that we're having right now. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I tend to agree that technology is a lever arm that we use to affect the material world. I think back to the Aztecs description or whomever it was of Cortez and his ships as basically being like clouds. And I try to think about from their perspective, the idea of harnessing the wind for seafaring propulsion, they see over a period of their lifetime, technology getting better to capture the wind, right? They had ships as well. They just weren't as big and powerful as the Spanish galleons. And yet there was an upper limit to how much energy you could extract from the wind and how big the ships could get and how fast they could move. And part of me wonders to the extent to which this technology that we've invented, what the sort of S curve is. So one of the big areas of disagreement between me as a millennial and a lot of Gen X folks is I think there's a difference between exponentials and S curves. And I haven't really seen a lot of the, my, my challenge with Ray Kurzweil as a Gen X thinker, and I don't really care if he's in Gen X or not, sure. is that he tends to extrapolate out too far. I think like, I remember in the late nineties when music became free and then everybody was just downloading all of this music. And the predictions were that the number of hours that people would spend listening to music would go to infinity, which obviously can't happen. Right. But that was the prediction. That was the exponential because that's what the supply and demand graph showed, right? Is if demand is virtually infinite and supply goes to zero dollars, then, you know, we should consume everything. And that's not what ended up happening. No, um, but, it, and, but the value curve of music itself has changed dramatically. But go on, finish yourself. No, what I was going to say is if you think about it in terms of the profit dollars in music, they didn't go away. They just shifted to other things. So we saw the rise of basically Burning Man and all these other festivals and carnivals. So in-person event experiences. Mm -hmm. Never had a chance to visit like a Taylor Swift concert. It's absolutely incredible from a production standpoint. Whether or not you like her music is irrelevant, but it's amazing experience that you could have. 
which wouldn't have been possible in the 80s because most of the excess profit dollars were flowing into distributors' pockets. And then, of course, the iPhone itself was funded on the backs of profit from the iPod, and the iPod was basically a device designed to store pirated music. And so we don't really have, and so there's a clear link in my mind between Napster and Uber. And it's very difficult when you see the emergence of Napster, which I very much feel like today's artificial intelligence, large language models are, to extrapolate and say, okay, we're going to have Uber within 20 years. I just, I find it really difficult. And yet looking back in hindsight, you can draw a very clear line between Uber and it. Yeah, a lot of things which tend to grow, it's interesting that you draw the distinction between S-curves and exponentials. And obviously nothing can grow exponentially forever. Okay, we, I think we agree on that baseline. But people who, and a lot of people who extrapolate exponentials have been wrong. If you look at everything from climate scientists to people who, you know, are basically predicting the end of the world over 20 years, it stubbornly refuses to arrive. And that's usually, that can sometimes be because we successfully avert whatever the issue was. And, but this happens over and over again in technology where an S curve, a breakthrough yields a sharp rise in either price performance ratio or whatever. And then S begins to level off a new breakthrough takes it to the next level. And that breakthrough wasn't possible before because it wasn't economical. But as technology keeps advancing, if another breakthrough is possible, then that curve can continue. The probably the most well-known example of this is Moore's law. The idea that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every, every what, five years, something like that. And so far, that's even though there are signs we're reaching certain kinds of limits, other technologies keep advancing that make it possible to, maybe not transistors literally, but the amount of compute in a certain amount of space for a certain amount of power seems to still be going up. And while I'm not so foolish to say that can go on forever, we've barely begun to scratch the surface of things that can be used for compute, biological tissues and things like that. So people are actually experimenting with now. I watched some mind-blowing videos recently actually showing computation being done with biology. Now, it's very primitive right now. Yeah, I just had a paper sent to me on this very topic. And I was like, oh, that's the plot for the matrix before they changed everybody into a battery because they didn't think people would be smart enough. Yeah, there, there's definitely some chilling possibilities here that we need to understand and avoid. And that's one of the reasons why I think this kind of conversation is really important, especially by people who, are, you know, are technologists like you and I and people who have, I'm a very much an optimist about the future, but I like Kurtz, I don't want to be a starry-eyed starry optimist. I think there are some real dystopian realities, some of which we're already facing. And I want the best for myself, for my kids, for the world. And, and you can't put this stuff back in, you can't put these genies back in the bottle. So you have to figure out how to work with them. And, uh, and that's why I think this kind of conversation is so important. One other metaphor I have been thinking about as I've been kind of catching up on Chris Law's thoughts is he uses the term singularity, which he borrowed from co cosmology, the idea of the singularity of a black hole. And I remember hearing the story told that if you have a if you were an observer and you could watch somebody falling into a black hole, just a little understanding of the laws of physics, obviously they'd die long before they got there. But as you watch them fall, they would go slower and slower. They would seem to be, from their own perspective, from their own frame of reference, they would appear to be going full speed into this event horizon. But from your perspective as a distant observer, they would appear to be going slower and slower, in a sense, never getting there, kind of asymptotically approaching it, but never getting there. And I feel like, again, this is, if we're seeing the singularities from the inside, how would we even know when we actually got there? Would we at some point say, yes, this is the day it's happened? Or would we say, this is how I expect life to be now. And yet it's entirely unimaginable to people a generation ago. And in some ways, I, I feel like we're already there. So I think there's an argument to be made that I remember when I put this topic up, your first response was, oh, we're not there yet. But I want to challenge that a little bit and say, how would we know? How would you know whether or not we've arrived at something like Kurzweil singularity? We'd all be dead. Let's that. Okay. Expand on that for me a little bit. So it's like the metaphor that I like to use is you're looking, first of all, I think one thing that we should unpack, so let's take a note is the difference between precision and accuracy and Kurzweil may be accurate. You just need to be very imprecise. Sure. And then like people like me are more on the precision side of this debate. And I always try to figure out how should I straddle, but the metaphor that I use for thinking about the arrival of the singularity is I used to take New Jersey transit. And so you would be standing on the train platform and you would see one of these Amtrak trains using the same train tracks. And it would be, it would appear to be going very slow in the distance when it was really small. 
And so you have this thing like, okay, I see the pace of technology changing. It doesn't seem like it's going very fast. I'm going to be able to keep up or at the very least, I'm going to be able to jump onto the train. And then as the train gets closer and closer to the station, your perception of it is that it speeds up and it just is speeding up so much faster that by the time it gets to you at the station, it shoots through 200 kilometers an hour, like a bullet train functionally. And it's not possible for you to jump on or for you to keep up or anything like that. And I think part of the existential angst people have around artificial intelligence and the singularity is that from their perspective, it actually also represents what I call like a cognitive singularity, which is to say that they're not able to reason very effectively beyond a certain point. Like other cognitive singularities would be like, what is an artificial wound's impact on human society? Unknown, right? Like it's very difficult to reason about these things until they're here. And so the fact that I'm still able to reason about technology in the next, in the near term, like three, six, 12 months from now, indicates to me that we haven't hit a singularity because I'm able to describe where the train is going. But the moment that we're not able to predict anything in technology, that to me would be the signal that we're actually inside of the singularity, hmm. where our basic ability to extrapolate patterns breaks down because the environment is changing faster than our perception is able to make sense of it. And as it stands right now, I'm still able to make sense of what the environment is doing. And certainly it's more difficult, but it is something that I'm still able to make sense of. So that would be like my indication about why not. And then there's a whole bunch of people that say something to the effect of when you observe the singularity as Kurzweil describes it, and as everybody is afraid of, the amount of time from, let's say, a crow level intelligence, like what, it, it, assuming that you have recursion discussion, uh, recursion and sort of intelligence improvement. So the machine is able to make a better machine that's able to work on itself. And you could say GitHub Copilot was able to go by itself and program itself and optimize every single one of its functions to be faster and better. It's not really true right now or possible from what we've seen based on the current technology. Doesn't mean that it won't be possible in the future though, but people argue about the length of time from that. So go from like a crow level intelligence to a God level intelligence. So you, I, I might look at it like you have chimpanzee, you have human, you have a small team of humans, which is four to eight people. And then you have an entire, all the human race, right? Or Twitter, if you think of Twitter as sort of a hybrid artificial general intelligence, where every person is a node slash neuron in the network. And so the predictions from AI sort of alarmists are that we'll go from a crow-like intelligence to human civilizational-like intelligence in a matter of 30 minutes. And then other people like Paul Cristiano, who is one of the AI alignment experts, think that this transition will take a period of two years. Paul Cristiano and others in the AI alignment space, so you have guys that are on one side who talks about how we're all gonna do drop dead from, you know, diamondoid particles that the machine releases to kill everyone at once after three days, and then that's on one side, and then you have Paul Cristiano on the other side. That's actually, I believe that there's going to be some very significant markers that we can see as the intelligence progresses. And I, like I said, I just don't see the recursion happening in the way that the te technology is being built. I do think it's very clever and we do see all of these things happening and it's getting close to us, right? It's certainly, it's a, it's very uncanny valley. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't believe that we're close to the singularity. And I think if you believe in what Eliezer is saying, like that a, how much do we care about as a human race about an anthill in Africa, right? We care not at all about right. it. And that would be distance between in cognitive ability between us and the AGI, if it was to achieve some kind of singularity as escape velocity. And if you think about it from that perspective, if the entire world was overrun with anthills, we would cut down like 99.9% .9 of them, because why would we use, why would we allow the ants to use all of humanity's resource, the world's resources like that? when point of fact, we believe we could use the resources better. And so if there is in fact a singularity type event, you would assume that AI would just kill everybody because it would think that it could use the resources better than us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this is why I think, okay, the moment, the crossover point in many people's minds is when we finally have an AI that can design its next, its successor AI. And if we can, if we consider ourselves to be actually general intelligence ourselves, then we would be the 
in the process of designing that first iteration. I think that's what you're calling recursion, basically, is that when you're, when you have a thing that can design something better than itself, in some sense, then that thing can design the next thing that's better to itself up to whatever limits the physical universe allows. Yeah. It's like the place that I would look at this is in semiconductor chip design. So today, nobody actually designs a semiconductor by hand. They use tools to design a semiconductor. And so it would be interesting if they were able to virtualize the design of a semiconductor where the ASICs were able to be reprogrammed with the way the new semiconductor design was. And then that performance on a task was able to feed back into the software design of the ASIC. And so then it becomes virtualized and then you could just run it a million times with some kind of evolutionary function to see it get better. But that's not what we're seeing, right? What we see is human beings use the tools to make better chips. And then the limiting factor is not our ability to virtualize those chip designs and test them. It's the applications that people then create. It's kind of like engineering is driving the innovation rather than the problem is driving the innovation. So the, pro the problem in chip design is not like, how do we do all of these things faster, better, better, cheaper. It's more like what technological capabilities do we have? And then how do we shoehorn them into helping us design better chips? It, would it seem to you though, that the pieces are starting to emerge that once we have to integrate them deeply enough, for example, like right now, large language models like GPT, you ask them for a citation of something that, that it answers you. And it gives you basically a confabulated URL. It looks plausible, but it doesn't actually exist as a URL because it's really just trying to predict the next step, the next word to type. So if it already started typing a URL, it's going to try to add to that URL unless it thinks it's done, in which case we'll move on. Whereas the next generations are going to basically going to remember their citations. They're going to know where they came from. So they'll actually be able to give you reasonable citations. That's only one piece though. There's many of these pieces where deep neural networks are being trained to do things that, that would be unimaginable for humans to do. Things like alpha fold that finds protein folding possibilities that performs millions of experiments that humans couldn't actually do that are molecular, molecularly accurate. And it just seems to me it's only a matter of time before we find, discover ways of weaving these together that really does form a general intelligence that, that can rival a human intelligence that may not be like human intelligence in certain ways, but that will convince most people you know, under most circumstances that it is in some way sentient. And we seem to have reached an inflection point where the kind of stalemate of artificial intelligence that's existed most of my life has been broken. That next level of the, uh, the next curve is starting there. And obviously it, it needed other breakthroughs before that to happen, but it's happened, you know, like for example, in terms of uh, chip density and things like that, but that's happening. Uh, it seems to me that it's really just a matter of time and we need to figure out more or less how we're going to prepare to deal with these things because I think they're rather inevitable. Yeah, the approach that I take is the U.S. military does not allow recruits to join who have below an 84 on the IQ test. Right. And there's some percentage of people, let's call it 12%, that score below 84%, uh, 84 on the IQ test. And that would mean like the opposite would be everybody above 116. And those people, the military has determined, are not fit to even dig ditches. And at the extent to which you believe that the military is representative of society as a whole because they have reasons for having every kind of person in the military from ditch diggers to generals. The idea that there are people with an IQ of 84 that are lower than that, who are not helpful, those people still exist in society. And so the question is, do the technologies that we have now take this to 95 or 100 or 105? And to your point, I think there's a difference between creating a human level intelligence and creating an intelligence that humans mistake for a human level intelligence. And I think where you are sitting on that dividing line is where you believe, you know, like for somebody who's below an 84 in intelligence, you could say that society as a whole is inscrutable because society as a whole has decided through this one application, the military, that they actually provide no value and they're not worth investing anything into. Um, and so you could say that there's already a case where people are obsoleted by where the general point in society is. And it's just that this technology may make more people obsolete. And from them, it looks like a god or it looks like an artificial intelligence, when in point of fact, it may not be an artificial intelligence. And I can't also help but wonder 
that if this isn't trying to approach a wall in every unit of time going half the distance of the wall, you see those you don't actually ever, yeah, you don't actually ever get to the wall, but does it really matter once you're like talking about angstroms or whatever distance away? Somehow I feel like that is also this thing with artificial intelligence, like how the self-driving car problem was easily solved and now we're 10 years into it and it feels like it's just as far away as it was 10 years ago. I think this is, I think this is, might be very similar to the AI that we experienced. Oh shit. Like we're going to be like upset about it for decades is what I think about. And more and more people are going to basically see it as all omniscient, but it still won't be. Then the question is like, how great is your Tesla for full self-driving today? Pretty great on the, on, in certain contexts. Obviously I, I think about these things is from the point of view of that lever and the longer lever I have, the bigger things I can move. And so when I think about how these emerging technologies are going to be useful to me as an individual, I think about, for example, again, this phone gives me access to the world's knowledge and conversations like this and so on. And artificial intelligence is going to give me the ability to think on many different scales that I can think right now, assuming that my thoughts are integrated enough with it. And of course, so when you're on the web, you can jump around from link to link, going down various rabbit holes and so on. We're already doing that to a certain extent. We're following this web of information, this external to our brains and yet is magnifying what we can do in the world. I continually tell people, especially young people, but adults as well, that if you want to know something, don't sigh that you just don't know it. You have no excuse not to know something. In fact, you have a better choice to choose to be ignorant of certain things and not study things because they'll take up your time and energy to study it. But don't make excuses about what you don't know because it's all out there. It's ready for you. Are you ready for it? Um, and th that's only going to get exponentially greater as these new technologies start to just creep into our lives in ways that we feel are normal and natural at that point. But then we look back only a few years later, realize that our lives have been transformed by them. Totally. All right, Jeff, what's your question? Hey guys, good to see you here. I would say my thinking on AI stuff is not particularly sophisticated, but two questions that I asked myself are one, is this, is the analysis of AI, just like any other technology, or do we actually need to think about it much differently? Number one. And then number two, insofar as we all believe that AI should, or new technology like AI should serve humanity, what does that look like? How do we measure that? What are the key, key indicators for that? And do you agree with that premise in the first place? We'll leave it there. All right. I'm going to address both of these questions. If that's all right, we'll yeah, go for it. So the way that I think about the first question, Jeff, is that if I were to get a tractor, then I can farm more productively. What we are seeing with AI is we are on the cusp of me giving the AI a goal, go contact AT&T and cancel my cell phone or call up the IRS and figure out the status of my tax return or check on the status of my health insurance claims with United Healthcare. That is not a tractor right? That is not linearly or exponentially increasing my capability. That is basically me creating a very simple golem of myself that acts on my behalf, that goes into the world and takes action, right? Now they're scoped down to a very particular set of things. But for me, that's a step change, right? To go from technological improvement, like a tractor, where I still have to operate the equipment. And you could think of it like a calculator or anything like that to I can give a goal to a system and it can go and solve that goal for me, right? So that's the answer to the first question of like, why do I think that this is different? And so then the question is, at what point is that co-pilot, if you will, that co-golem, I call it a golem, is it more capable than I could ever be? And of course, it's going to be more capable already in Go. So I could say, go play Go against Jeff Giese and it would beat you right? If it was alpha go, but that's not super interesting financially right now because go doesn't define our reality. But if I was to say, go act as a thousand college freshman analysts and tell me which stocks are misvalued by looking at all these 37 factors and create reports and all of these kind of things, then that greatly accelerates my ability to make decisions. And the AI is going to have to exercise some level of discernment in figuring out what it wants to present to me. And so that is, I think, the biggest thing there. The second question is the same test that I use evaluating religions and ideologies. And that is, does this technology or religion increase the number of births per woman 
in the society or culture that adopts it. So if I'm thinking about is AI beneficial to the human race, are we producing more than 2.1 children per woman for people that adopt this technology? And if, it, if we are, then it is good for the human race. You can go read David Deutsch's Beginning of Infinity to talk about like, how people are basically the bottleneck in all of our systems. We need more people. We don't have enough people. We need more people. So the way that I normalize all ideologies, all religions, and the effect of technology is at a human level, is this creating more humans or not? And so if you see a bunch of people using AIs, primitive AIs, and the birth rate is going down, then it's bad for humanity. That's just the way that I think about it. Isn't it more about how they use it than that they use it? For instance, a lot of people I expect will use AIs of one form or another to, to as much as possible, actualize their, their narcissism and essentially kind of use it as a new form of escapism and therefore have less children. On the other hand, I can imagine a young person using an AGI essentially giving the directive, be my life coach. Tell me what I need to do to become a better person. Help me manage my life so I, I can become the best provider possible to carry on the human race and attract the best quality mate. In fact, help me find the best quality mate kind of thing, which could lead to creating more humans. So by that metric, it just seems to me it's not the fact of the existence of AGIs, but how people choose to use them. Yeah. I, the way that I, sorry, Jeff, I just want to respond to Wolf and then get you back in here. The way that I think about that, Wolf, is we already see that with the internet today. It basically amplifies whatever people are going to do. And if you don't have children, you disappear within two generations as an ideological construct. So the people that select for narcissism, they won't be around in three generations. As the mm -hmm. people that use the AGI to have three children, they will be around in three generations because they have more than 2.1 children. And so the humanity as a whole will still be growing, if that makes sense. So I feel like there's a selection bias that happens on yeah. this. So like when I evaluate things like feminism, the average woman who believes in feminism has one child. And if I look at something that's not feminists, like you, know, you look at like Amish people or Orthodox Jews or whatever, the average woman in those communities has like say three to four children let's call it four so if i push out five generations there's one feminist and there's a thousand orthodox religious people right and so that's okay. how i tend to think about these ideologies i'm like okay this is a self-extinguishing ideology so that so it is not positive for the human race because it does not create more people and will get out competed given enough generations okay. of course there's a yeah i want i want to get Actually, go ahead, Jeff, say your mind. I want to yeah. have a response. Yeah, I was just going to say in the first, thank you guys. On, on the first question, I think I can buy the step leap as opposed to linear on the technology that this is, that the analysis is different with AI from other technologies. I can buy that argument. On the second question about how do we measure or what indicators do we look at to ensure that it's being used in the, to benefit humans? I'm really not convinced. <laughs> That seems like, and my, Michael, I appreciate your rubric framework and it works for like civilizational, religious ideologies, competing one tribe of humans against another. But I'm not sure that I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of holes that can be poked into it for AI in particular, uniquely and in general. And I think that's a subject area that needs a lot more thought. I did want to add two, two other kind of minor points to the conversation. One, it seems like there are a lot of downstream effects of AI that we haven't really even fully appreciated or understood or adapted to. And one example of that, so I've been doing some research in the aerial and overhead technologies and have basically come to the conclusion that we're in a new age of discovery and that we can map the world. We have the technology to inventory and map every tree on the planet. Um, and that's because of AI and AI enabled technologies. And so when you think about that, like there's literally no place you can hide on the planet with aerial intelligence and the visibility that it gives us into is into the world or even like the Turkey, Syria or earthquake. I'm like, why aren't we using drones for search and rescue with thermal imaging, AI enabled th thermal imaging to find people under the rubble, just as an example, like there, that's a whole implication. I don't think we've fully adapted to. And then the other thing I think about some scattered, you know, a little scattered here is just the emotional impact of what is it going to be like to have technology that's smarter than we are? And you mentioned, Michael, the, what was it? The 85 IQ thing in the military. What if it's 
better than 140 IQ people. Right now, you could see a case where somebody, what if my kid goes to chat GPT for advice before coming to me? That's weird. That's an interesting emotional adaptation to think about. So I think there's, I think the emotion, I'm very confident in humanity and our ability to adapt to new technologies, but I think there's a whole emotional landscape around these technologies that we haven't quite, that we don't, like you guys said earlier, like we don't even have a clue about and that um, that's going to need to be processed and digested. And that's going to, there's going to be a whole emotional landscape around this stuff in my view. I'll, yeah, I'll, this, morning, I'll there. this morning is just an example of what you're talking about, Jeff. I got up this morning and I've been studying Spanish using Duolingo for a couple of years now. And I got up this morning and thought, I wonder if I could use GPT-3 for this. So I just asked it in Spanish, ask me something interesting about myself. And it asked me what my favorite pastimes were. So we began dialoguing essentially with it, interviewing me in Spanish about my interests and me having to compose Spanish sentences using iOS's translate feature to go back and forth between English and Spanish as necessary so I could construct good sentences and just continue the interview stepwise like that. I just thought, wow, I'm actually using it as a language coach, not GPT-3 by itself, but with augmented with a little bit of language translation feature that's more reliable. But it was really another eye-opening experience. And I've had several with, with this technology. Another thing I want to throw in before Mike responds again is the idea that these technologies are two-edged swords. You can, I like your metric that if it increases human flourishing and survival, then it's probably good. But, and then certain like religious beliefs and so on do that in that sense. But it seems to me that the other edge of that sword is the, the idiocracy scenario where people are basically, where people of lower education also have more kids. And if they're, if the incentive structures are not in place externally, then those kind of long-term perverse incentives lead to a, a dummy down of the population over time. So feel free to take that wherever you like, Michael. Yeah, that would be the case if there was no market, right? If men didn't have to compete in a competence hierarchy, then I agree with you. Then the dumb people having a bunch of children and being taken care of by the AI, like an argument against utopia, that would be very problematic. But if dumb people are having a lot of children, and human intelligence is partially heritable, but not entirely, then statistically, you're going to get some people who are genius levels who are born to quote unquote dumb parents, and then they're going to compete in the competence hierarchy like everybody else. And it will be a net benefit for society. So I actually don't take such a dim view of idiocracy, even though I think it's fashionable, especially among like my peers in academia and whatnot to be like, oh, all the dumbest people on earth are procurating. Ha ha ha. And then have more children, damn it. Um, well, I, agree. I, I genuinely agree with you, but I get super continue. frustrated as I'm like, okay, fine. They're dumb, but they're producing like produce. It's part of life. Like for fuck's sake, everyone's I, like, I'm always on my brother that he should have kids too. And, but he's, he's in a different culture from me entirely. And I just try to point out that there's a bunch of men in that culture who have children and that they do really well. And so anyway, my point is like, I agree with you also, Jeff, that maybe the idea that it doesn't be the number of births per woman is like a bad metric. And definitely I agree that we need to come up with better metrics for determining its use. I just haven't been able to find something that's normalized across all the different areas of society quite like the birth rate. I'm always open to thinking about it. Like, for example, if the AI can be used to increase the educational attainment, like the Gutenberg Crest was for literacy, but it did that for everyone on earth at almost no cost, that would be amazing, right? Like the way Wolf was describing learning Spanish, what if that was like all the Salvadorians? Since El Salvador is in the news late, lately, what if all of them were able to have an AI tutor that brought them up to the level educational attainment of France or the United States or whatever. And if it, it was variably free for El Salvador to deploy that, like what would be the implications of that? Very profound. And then you scared the crap out of me, Jeff, with your statement about the emotional development, because what am I going to do in 10 years when my girls and my son use AI to talk, to ask a like a deep life question, what should I do with my life? And then consult with the AI Oracle instead of me. That sucks. And so now I'm going to spend the next six months thinking about that. Thank you. My, my 18 year old son is already sending me screenshots from his high school classrooms of things he's talking to GPT-3 about what, during class, essentially. Some of which are just funny experiments, but this is, this is how things are going to go. People, and I've just found myself asking questions lately. I think um, my Google clue is strong, but I'd just like to just ask chat GPT what it thinks. And I've gotten really, some really decent answers that at least have formed good point, jumping off points for the research. And so 
I think we are reaching the neck of this curve where AI is just going to be part of our lives. It's going to be, we're not going to remember what life was like before that point. And just bring back to my original thesis is that how will we recognize the singularity when it arrives? Because yeah, everything's going to still seem normal around us, even though everything will have changed and we won't be able to even know what's going to happen in the next one or two years, which is where we are now. And yeah, I respect that as a, as an investor and somebody who you know, is a technologist, you obviously are betting on various things out there to succeed and you have to believe in yourself in terms of what to bet on. But far more investors as investors have a portfolio and they lose like on 8% of their bets and make on 20% of their bets. So they're mostly wrong. But it's the ones that, are, the, that they're right on win big. That will probably continue too. If anybody else would like to speak, please raise your Oh, I see Owen. Sorry, I just looked at my screen. Please, let's see. Yeah. Where are we? Yeah. Come here. So I, yeah, please. My, my thought was, I do think that trying to measure whether AI is good for the human race just by whether it creates more humans seems like a narrow lens because I could certainly envision that AI could enable eugenics, which would mean you might create super intelligent babies. And there are already, there is already thoughts that's so we're nearing that with our technology today, where parents would be able to choose a more intelligent gene for their child. And there's also talk about having these embryos outside the body where you can essentially create children <laughs> in other ways. And so I can imagine what I would consider a very dystopian future where you're creating lots of people. Right. And I think to me, that just speaks to saying the challenge here is to say, who's going to be designing the props? Who's going to be designing the goals for what humanity should look like or what our world should look like? Because that the way I look at AI is it's a tool. It would probably hopefully be under the control of humans to direct it in a direction, but it would take a lot of wisdom and, a, and maybe a lot of restraint to say you're not going to push things in a disastrous direction. Your government provided AI coach that comes free, taxpayer funded, is probably also going to have an ideology embedded in it. And if it turns out that it's a socialist one or a communist one or whatever, then a lot of people will just take its word for granted. And because it provides so much other useful information that helps them do better in life, why not take that stuff for granted as well? People thinking this is one of my hobby horses is people learning to think critically about everything they're exposed to and not look at things as just one dimensional and realize that there's many ways we have to evaluate these things. And just how do we teach that to our kids and how do we learn that better as adults living in this world of information and a lot of it, bad information coming out at us from all directions. Michael, you had a thumbs down a moment ago. You expressed a strong opinion there. What do you think? Oh, I don't like the idea of selecting. Before I had children, I didn't, was definitely on the pro abortion side for people with Down syndrome and just genetic abnormalities. So like Gattaca style. And then I had, children, mm -hmm. I realized I had a complete 180 where I'm like, that is a really bad idea. And I know there's entire societies today where they abort all of the Down syndrome kids. And that I feel is fundamentally morally wrong. And I'm very much challenged by what Owen was talking about because I was like, what if I, I Owen was speaking about it favorably, just this is one possible dystopian branch we could end up on if we're not careful. Yeah, no, I agree. And I definitely think societies will choose to have designer eugenics babies. I definitely believe that. And people will use way, it to like ethnically cleanse and all of that stuff. So I'm just. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, Gattaca is a great, it's still a great film. It's withstood the test of time. Yeah. All right, Jeff, what do, what do you Jeff, want to say? Yeah. yeah, I mean, on that, I don't know if I see this issue as tied into babies and collection. Like, I don't necessarily see that connection with we have advanced reproductive technology now, which I'm quite familiar with. So I'm not sure how I see AI changing that. And I also think, as we discussed earlier, AI could actually diminish the advantages of being smart, for example. So it's not clear to me what we would want to select for in the future. But the thing that I wanted to bring up is what is, and again, I'm coming at this from not a particularly sophisticated point of view. I haven't thought about these issues too much, but I'm just curious, how would you respond if I just came at, came at you guys and said, look, AI is inherently communist. It's inherently autocratic. It's inherently centralized. And even my question about how do we measure, how do we make sure it's serving humanity? Even if we got aligned on that, like this whole centralized heuristic, right? And that, so how do you respond to the argument that this is a evil communist technology that's going to consolidate power and become autocratic in some form or fashion that we should stop it by any means necessary? How do you respond to that? Let me go first on that one, Michael. First of all, I'd want to know what your actual evidence was for that argument, but also I'd point to the history of technology that 
technologies tends to start out being large and decentralized with like mainframe computers and then many computers and then microcomputers and then the internet. And, then, and then, so the options of decentralization start to grow as the cost curve comes down. And these things tend to become more individualized. For example, right now, OpenAI is running GPT-3 for better or worse. It's not the only large language model out there. Google's got Lambda and all of that. But Dolly 2, which is also by OpenAI, for image generation is also stable diffusion, which is not only open source, but people are training with all kinds of models for specialized kinds of image generation now. And that's, and so if you want to run your own large language model, give it a few years, it's going to become much more, dare I use the word democratized, and it's going to become much more something that is in the palm of your hand, as opposed to running on some big remote server or something you can have much more fine grained control over. Michael? We've always been at war. We will always be at war. It's the shelling point that I end up in, Jeff, because you're absolutely right. Some people use AI to push a communist, or if you don't like, if you like communism, then they'll use it to push fascist or they'll use it to push their own agenda. And how do you solve for that? This is what Eli Eiser is talking about with the alignment problem. He's like, oh, we should just ban everybody from using large GPU clusters, which is really not a thing, right? Like we're experiencing a cold war race right now in biologic weapons using CRISPR and MR CRISPR, right? You have all these labs all over the world that are accelerating the evolution of viruses by hundreds of thousands of years in a sort of like an arms race, if you will, with biological weapons, and it's totally and completely just running. And so I see the exact same thing happening with, you know, we have laws that say don't create biological weapons. And yet there's all this evidence and whistleblowers coming out from all these bio labs all over the world, then they call it gain of function, but they're functionally like running influenza, running every disease known to man with hundreds of thousands of years of evolution in a matter of months. And that's for bioweapons. So like with AI, we're going to do the same thing. Like the cost to train a GPT-3 based AI is like $5 million in compute and $5 million in labor from an engineering side. And then I think it's $990 million in sort of reinforcement learning that humans go in and label the data is basically what they're saying. And Facebook just came out with an open source version that's one tenth the cost. And so it's, I think it's a total war right now. And the game theory that all the AI alignment folks have, are in is we're just going to release everything that we have open source as soon as we can, because that's the best way to know what's going on for everyone to know what's going on. But yeah, I, I come back to we're at war. We've always been at war. We will always be at so, war. So I, both of you make great arguments against what I was saying. I want to follow the geopolitical thread for a second. So if we're at, in an AI war and you're a realist, right? And there's a real politic nature of it. Where do you think that leads us collectively? And is that what might be similar to say nuclear technology and what might be different about it? It's still hard for individuals to build nuclear bombs. I don't think it's going to be very hard at all very soon for us to be running this, that, that augment our intelligence under our own roof, on our own CPUs or GPUs, in our own homes. You go all whole Kurzweil then in our own bodies, but I'm not sure I'm ready to go there yet. But uh, I tend to think just the cost is going to come down so dramatically that part of what we're going to be doing with these AGIs is countermeasures against what other people are doing with their AGIs of various kinds. <laughs> Michael. Okay. So there's a couple of things from a, I, I'm a Mearsheimer guy, so I'm an offensive realism guy. That's my whole foreign policy stance. Um, I would say a couple of things. Number one is the cost of nuclear grade uranium and plutonium enrichment has gone down by three or four orders of magnitude since the forties. We don't talk about the specific ways to enrich those things, but functionally you can create weapons grade uranium in a high school gymnasium, the same amount of power. And so my anticipation is that over the next two decades, we'll see dozens to hundreds of sub-state actors get access to nuclear weapons. However, I think that Wolf's point about the declining cost of AI is even more significant. So you could imagine a scenario where a very particular ethnic group decided that they would marry up this bioweapons research, which is specific biological alleles, where you could generate viruses that attack these things, and you could just have your AI convince people who are operating a CRISPR lab in the United States or wherever to print these things up. And then there's a lab release and then it's, you know, and I don't really understand how you defend against that kind of attack. So again, for me, it represents a total singularity, Jeff. And I know that's probably not the answer that you wanted to get, but 
I don't even think we need to get artificial general intelligence or the singularity to get those kind of scenarios. And I don't really know what the story is. I also don't know what the story is with the chip banning. Part of me thinks that there's been a fundamental breakthrough in quantum computing. And that's the entire reason for the U.S. banning high-tech advanced manufacturing capability for semiconductors to China. Basically, like the U.S. is using its quantum computers to break encryption. And they're trying to stop the Chinese from doing this. And anyway, evidence for that, I haven't seen any evidence against it. But so, yeah, I don't really understand at this level, like what it what the implications are. I mean, like you're going to have an AI that can convince everybody with, to your point, below 140 IQ to do, to believe things that aren't necessarily true. And yeah, I don't know what you do. They're going to create an information environment just to them. Yeah. Really understand. That's a good summary. I think of what the singularity might entail is not understanding what's going on around us at that very moment, even though expect life will also feel very normal in many ways, because like you say, we're at war with East Asia. We've always been at war with East Asia and, and things going wrong are just say la guerre. With that, we've gone an hour and I really want to thank the people who have participated. Michael, I think this is again, an excellent conversation and you want to quickly have reintroduce yourself for both people for attending and for the record, this will be up on YouTube, but go ahead, Michael. Yes. Thank you. I'm Michael Gimmer and you can find me at Michael Gimmer on Twitter. I really appreciate the discussion today and the questions. I would like to continue having these conversations. I agree with you that at the point at where we're unable to answer any of these questions, maybe that is the example that we've crossed into the singularity. And I'm Wolf McNally, a technologist, creator of Flying Logic, which is a tool to help people improve systems and think better at flyinglogic.com. And my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash at beware of wolf podcast. My conversations with Michael Gimmerin are appearing there steadily, all chapterized because we go through such many so many topics so several of them are already up more will continue appearing there so i invite you all to subscribe there and thank you so much for attending and i'm looking forward to our next conversation mike thank you so much